good morning. Come in, come in. You're late already. Time to sit down. Um, hello. Yes, I'm Trisha. I know you don't recognize me because Mark told me he was going to plaster my face all over Islington, so I cut all my hair off so I could be completely anonymous. Um, so yes, that is me, apparently. Uh, I'm Trisha. I work for JetBrains. I'm the developer advocate for um, Java and IntelliJ IDEA there. What that means is that um, a lot of my job is sort of staying on top of the trends with Java, like how it's moving, how the language is moving, how it impacts real Java developers, um, which used to be easy in the olden days when Java had a, a nice enterprise-level release cadence. Um, but now things are changing so rapidly, it's, it's a much more challenging job. And so what I wanted to do with this talk is to take everything I've learned with all the news that I've been reading and kind of give you the TLDR version of what's happening in Java, um, particularly like how to move off Java 8 or if you want to move off Java 8. Because upgrading from Java 8 sounds scary um, and, uh, and I don't want to pay for Java, which is kind of where a lot of people are. Uh, I'm super happy with Java 8, thanks. I'll just stick with it. And um, so before we sort of really launch into this talk, let's, uh, let's talk about my super scientific Twitter poll results. Which version of Java are you using? Everyone's using Java 8. Twitter only lets you put in four um, entries on your poll, so this doesn't record anyone who's anyth using anything under than Java 8. And Java 12 hadn't come out yet, so I didn't get to ask that question either. So let's ask you lot. Um, who's using Java 12 in production? One person who quickly put their hand down. <laughs> Who's using Java 11? OK, that's a quite a lot, actually. About 10, 15% of you. Uh, who's using Java 10? OK, you should go to 11. Um, who's using Java 9? No one, good. Uh, and Java 8? Oh, everyone. Uh, Java 7? Really? Java 6? Are you Android developers? <laughs> you should be using Kotlin. Um, so these, this poll results kind of roughly reflects generally what the development community is doing. A lot of people quite happy with Java 8. Uh, almost no one on 9 and 10, and a chunk of people on Java 11. Um, and no space to talk about Java 12. Now, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the shape of, this, uh, of these results, because you'd sort of expect it to be more of a curve than, um, than like no one using 9 and 10, although Martin kind of referred to why that is in the keynote this morning, so I don't have to go over that too much. But what we will talk about is we will talk about, to begin with, releases, updates, licensing, and support. These are the kind of like, if you like, kind of political changes around the Java ecosystem since, uh, since Java 8 came out. Now, this was covered a little bit in the keynote this morning, so that's kind of good because I don't need to cover it too much, but it's also kind of good to, to get two different um, views on the same stuff so that we can be all on the same page of what's happening in the, in the ecosystem. So first up, we are getting releases of Java every six months, which is nice, and they come out like clockwork in March and September. So we are getting predictable releases on predictable dates, which is good from a sort of continuous delivery point of view. Now, obviously, um, if you're going to release this frequently, there's really very little appetite from companies like Google to support these releases, Google, um, Oracle, to support these releases for up to three years, like they were doing before, or even four years. Because at some point in the future, they're going to be supporting like seven different versions of Java. And if, if, if you've ever developed libraries, then you know that you don't want to support more than like one version of your application. Um, so supporting that many is is quite a, a challenging thing to do and costly. So um, what they said is we'll do six monthly releases, but when the new release comes out, that supersedes the previous release. So we're not going to support all of these releases. So every six months, you'll get a new release of, of Java, and you're sort of expected to upgrade to that next version of Java. With the exception of every three years, there will be a long-term support release, which was Java 8, um, is Java 11, and will probably, I expect, be Java 17 in some time in the future. Um, so now we have two different types of releases. We have our um, interim releases, our six monthly releases, and we have our long-term support releases, the LTS releases, every three years. Now, what's important to understand, oh, um, who, who didn't know this, by the way? It's fine to put your hands up, because if you did know this, it's pointless me telling you, right? OK, this is good. This is good that you didn't know this, because it's important to understand the changes in, in the release cycle. Now, 
This applies specifically to Oracle. This is a decision that Oracle have taken around their JDK and how, they're how they are going to develop um, Java going forward and how they're going to support it going forward. Generally speaking, um, this idea of long-term support releases and which versions are going to be long-term support releases has been adopted by the community as a whole. But this is, this is the Oracle story, and this is kind of driven by Oracle. Now, let's get even more legal. Starting with Java 11, Oracle will provide JDK releases under one particular license and a commercial license for Oracle JDK, Oracle products, uh, replaces BCL licenses, blah, blah, blah. Oh my goodness, uh, what, what does this mean? This sounds frightening and overly complicated. Talk us through it. This is from a favorite movie in our, uh, in our household, the Lego Batman movie. It's a very important quote to remember. So it sounds kind of complicated. What do you mean? You're going to have two different licenses. You're going to have long-term support releases. You're going to have six monthly release cadence. Um, and uh, you're going to have a, co a commercial JDK and an open JDK. But wasn't open JDK a different thing to the commercial JDK? What does it all mean? <coughs> Ultimately, and again, you saw this in the keynote with Martin. Oracle are offering two different choices. You can take the, co the commercial offering from Oracle, which includes the long-term support releases, which will be supported for a period of three years, and pay for it. Or you can take the um, Oracle OpenJDK builds, which will come out every six months, and upgrade every six months. From Java 11 onwards, the Oracle JDK builds, the commercial builds, will effectively be the same as the OpenJDK builds. So that's a useful thing to understand, that these two builds are the same. They're kind of the, one of the reasons why they are two separate deployables, if you like, is that they have two different licenses, a commercial license and an open source license. Uh, oh, so I've just explained to you. Yes, you will have two different licenses. Uh, you'll have the open JDK one, which is free, but will be replaced every six months. And you have the commercial JDK, which has the LTS support, so it will be updated, and you will get paid for support for three years. Uh, but you have to pay for it to use it in production. It's free for um, testing and personal development, but in production, you have to pay. The important point, though, is the thing we said earlier. From Java 11 onwards, Oracle JDK builds and Open JDK builds will be essentially identical. So all of the commercial stuff that used to be in um, Oracle's JDK, things like um, flight recorder, mission control, all that stuff which separated the commercial JDK from Open JDK is now in Open JDK. So this is good. If you get an OpenJDK build, you're going to get all the features that you expect to get from Java. And this is great because, again, this is kind of mentioned in the keynote, OpenJDK has multiple different types of builds. So we're not just reliant on, um, on Oracle for this. We have a bunch of different vendors. Like, and dear vendors, please stop emailing me and asking me to put more different logos on here. The point is, there are lots of different people who provide you with free and paid for builds of OpenJDK, and they are all functionally complete. They all do what you expect from Java. Um, I don't need to go too much into the adopt OpenJDK story, because we heard about this this morning in the keynote. But by default, I think this would be an interesting choice, because it is uh, supported by a bunch of the different vendors. It's a, a build of OpenJDK. It is a community effort. Um, and they offer a bunch of different builds for a bunch of different platforms. And they have um, long-term long -term support releases for at least four years. Um, and they will be supporting Java 8 LTS until 2023, and Java 11 until September 2022. I don't really understand that, but it's in the future, so it's not important. Right, so all of that still sounds overly complicated and a little bit frightening. So why on earth would we bother? I'm super happy with Java 8. I don't really understand um, all these different things that came in. And on top of that, aren't we forgetting to mention the elephant in the room about Java 9 broke everything? <laughs> Uh, which it didn't, by the way. Please don't sue me, Oracle, for saying that. Uh, but let's talk about why you might want to move from Java 8 to something more modern, given that it's become sort of surprisingly complicated to, to upgrade, uh, or at least make the decision to upgrade to a new version of Java. Now, we're developers, so we're interested in the language features. So once again, I took to Twitter to find out what are the most interesting features that people who are using recent versions of Java are using. So which are the features that are most useful to us as developers? Um, the first of these kind of surprised me, uh, which was a lot of people said that they use JShell a lot, which is the REPL. Um, who knows what a REPL is? 
Okay, who knows what J-Shell is? Okay, that's weird, like there's a different set of people. Um, so <laughs> J-Shell is the way to be able to try out um, writing Java stuff in, um, on the command line. So I'll do a quick demo of this, uh, which will, of course, fail because live demos always fail. So let's look. I'll do it from inside uh, a command line because <laughs> I work for an IDE company, so let's go to the command line. Um, <laughs> God, I hope no one from JetBrains is watching this. Right, so you can just start JShell. The interesting thing about JShell here is um, it's an independent tool. So it doesn't matter what version of Java your application is running in. You can run whichever version of JShell you happen to want to run. So I'm running the Java 12 version um, because now I have like six different versions of Java installed on my laptop because that's where we are. So we can start with something like, obviously, we can say system.out. I get tab completion, which is useful because I'm used to working inside an IDE. And I can say, hello. Oops. Well, whatever. And oh, that's nice. That's new. And that matches your brackets for you. And you don't need a semicolon. Yay. <laughs> Java has come so far. <laughs> so proud of you. But more interesting than, than we don't need a semicolon is we don't need to create a public class with a public static void main blah, blah, blah. We just need to write this. We still need to write system to out print learn, apparently, but that's the way it goes. Um, so we get tab completion. We don't have to write a load of boilerplate. Um, we don't have to do semicolons. We can define variables easily, so I can say, I don't know, uh, int i equals 5, uh, which is nice. Or I can say, I can even just say some number. And it will just assign it to uh, like an anonymous uh, variable. Um, I can define methods. So I don't, uh, let's say public void do something to so something. The problem with using the command line is that I, I can't use all my IDE tricks for like automatically typing stuff for me. Um, and then I can do something like uh, let's system dot now dot print learn. Uh, let's print then something. Here, I do need a semicolon. So I've created a new method. Let me move that up in case you can't see it. I've created myself a new method. Um, I have a forward reference. So it supports forward references too. So you can start defining, like hacking out the stuff that you want. Then I, if I call do something, uh, then I'm assuming it's going to error. It gives me some useful error. And then I can define something. Let's say uh, var something, because I'm using Java 12, so I can use var. Uh, hi. And now I can call do something. Oops. And I get hi. OK. So it's quite nice. You can start hacking around and playing with stuff. I found this really useful when I was trying to figure out how the new collections factories um, worked and at what how I could access different types of collections, whether they were modifiable. A lot of new features can be played with inside here. There's um, a tutorial which just came out. It was on DZone, I saw it, about how to use the new switch expressions, which I'll also show you. And that uses JShell to demo those features too. So it's quite a nice way to just sort of play with new features in particular. Also, you can do things like um, you can uh, save this stuff into, a, into an external file. You can load external files. You can effectively do scripting and things like that if you want to. So um, it's just quite a nice way to do to work in a very different way to how we're used to working in Java. Now, I don't really know. I, I was surprised. There's quite a lot of people on Twitter who are using this. Um, I think traditionally, other languages have been used for these kinds of features. It's quite nice to be able to, to use a language like Java that we're familiar with um, in this kind of way. I don't really know if, ev if anyone's going to be doing scripting in Java or not. But um, it's an interesting idea. Um, and there's also a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of like, helper stuff. You can see things like, uh, you can see the history of what you did. You can see, um, what else have you got, like vars, I guess. Um, everything that's defined. And uh, yeah, so you've got commands that you can use as well. So that's JShell. Uh, that's kind of cool. So I already demoed this a little bit inside JShell. People are using var, which came in Java 10. A um, bunch of people saying var. I like var, 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 var. Because, um, because people don't like typing. <laughs> and it's those three characters, they save you so much. Uh, 
Not necessarily, but you know, it can help reduce some of the boilerplate. So let's, um, let's move into my IDE, because as I said, I work for an IDE company, so this seems it's like a sensible thing to do. Um, I've turned on the inspection and IntelliJ idea, which will tell me all the places where I could use VAR. Now, I don't recommend doing this, because as you can see, there's a lot of gray here, and basically it's going to suggest that everything can be turned into a VAR. I do not recommend using var for all of your variables, because the whole point about var is to reduce duplication, to increase readability. But if you've got some stuff like, let's see if we can find a silly uh, example. Um, yeah, let's say we turn that into a var, then we really, we really have no idea what this is, because it's got a useless name, and it calls, like, potentially a, a not super useful method. So um, the readability here, obviously, you can get the IDE to show you, like, what is this? Oh, it's a, it's a list. That's fine. But um, VARA kind of removes a lot of the, use, the, the useful information there. Um, but obviously, where you've got things like duplication, like this, then I can, say, replace that with VAR. IntelliJ will move that person bit inside your generics over to the other side, so now everything's kind of declared in, in a, a shorter way. So if that's the sort of thing that you like, that's quite nice. I've been using it a bit since I've been using Java 10 and onwards. I found VAR kind of useful. It's not, it's not a fix-all for everything, but it is useful for things like... Uh, so here's a real example, <laughs> because Java's not verbose at all, um, where we're iterating over something and we have something uh, map entry, it's got all those types, and I really don't care that much about those types. So this is a really good place where I'm like, I just don't really care about that. It's just not important to me. So it's important to understand VAR is not about dynamic types. VAR is about reducing duplication in your code. It's about not having to declare the type if you don't need to declare the type. Um, again, for like long, for long type names and stuff like that. Um, so that's VAR. What else have we got? <coughs> Um, my favorite feature, which came in Java 9, and I've been using it ever since, is the convenience factory methods for collections. So list.of, map, uh, map and set.of, a um, bunch of people using this, uh, collection factories. So um, I will do a quick demo of what this is. Um, because at first, when I first heard about this feature, I was like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting, but like, uh, it's not really that big a deal. Um, but it's more interesting than you think. Well, I think so. I mean, whatever. So generally speaking, when we create lists, we've often used uh, like arrays.as list to create what we thought was an immutable list. Uh, it's not, by the way. It's not an immutable list. You can't add to it, but you can alter the elements inside that list, which I didn't really realize. I've just been using it willy-nilly, thinking it's immutable, and it's not. Um, so things can be modifying your, your list willy-nilly. So what you're supposed to do is you should wrap it inside an unmodifiable list. Uh, and so then you have this kind of like really unwieldy way of creating something when you just really just wanted a list of values, perhaps for a test or for a drop down or something like that. So in Java 9, uh, and later, obviously, uh, you can just replace that with a list of. So that's nice. It's a genuine convenience method. It's like super useful. Um, it's kind of nice for list. It's really useful for set, because for set, we had to create a list and then put it in a hash set and then wrap it in an unmodifiable set. <laughs> Ah, uh, boilerplate. See what you mean, right. There's quite a lot of boilerplate in Java. So I can just replace this with a set of. Ah, oh, that's much better. Now I see exactly what I'm getting. I'm creating a set of these two values, and I can't modify it, can't do anything with it. Like, I can't um, unexpectedly modify it. Um, and set, uh, sorry, map is particularly interesting because if you're creating a map with a set of values, which I used to, when I worked at MongoDB, I used to do this a lot because you create maps to put into MongoDB. Um, and doing this in Java is quite unwieldy. Doing it in languages like Groovy or a bunch of other languages, it, it was quite nice. In Java, it's, it's not so nice. We have to kind of put it inside this great big static thing. Um, let's see if this is going to automatically get set to something useful, or if it's going to destroy the formatting. Ah. Destroy the formatting. Um, did you know this quick tip, by the way? This will be in my talk on uh, 4 o'clock. Um, you can press Alt and Enter onto any block of code and adjust your code style settings. And it will tell you just the settings that apply to that block. <coughs> so I'm going to say something like, uh, oh, I don't think that's really what I want. But um, I could say, like, wrap always. <laughs> so I can get this. Amazing. 
that's really improved things. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> Let's go back and just reformat all of this. And um, so, yeah, so you can do a map of entries, and obviously you can static import this stuff so, um, so that you remove some of this boilerplate. Great. Oops, what did I just do? And um, so you can kind of get something which is marginally more readable than it was before. What's really interesting is if you've got, um, let's undo all of that and start again. Uh, is if you've got just a limited set of values to put in here. So let's say we've just got um, like mm, six or seven. Then when I do this, it will give me a map of, so it's a uh, key value, key value, key value, just up to 10 values because like, I guess they just couldn't be bothered to write so many overrides for unlimited numbers. Uh, but yeah, so you can use this if you want to, to um, for convenience for creating maps. It's nice. It's not as nice, uh, in my personal opinion, it's not quite as nice as the groovy syntax, but it's definitely a massive improvement over what we had before. Super useful for things like test code, where we have to set up sets of data and then run it through the tests. Um, as well as this, uh, related, so those um, convenience factory methods, they produce unmodifiable collections. So when we start using these, we don't get unexpected behavior with people altering our collections. Um, in later versions of Java, Java 10 actually, um, we got the ability to collect to unmodifiable collections. So instead of saying collectors.to list, we could say collectors.to unmodifiable list. So that's kind of like super useful. So I can start, when I want to return a list of values from my method, I can return an unmodifiable list and know that no one's going to be like tinkering with my collections underneath the covers. It's much safer. Um, related, we also got some new methods on the stream API. This is in Java 9. Um, we got things like take while. So this was kind of a feature which was missing from the Java 8 streams, where we have the ability to do something like um, do this, this stream operation until some criteria is met. So take all of these values until some value, until something is met. Or the alternative is drop while. So ignore, 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 ignore until some criteria is met, and then start processing the stream. So it's a really useful addition to the streams API. Another useful addition that will help us when working with the streams API is, um, is predicate.not. So there was a bit of argument over whether to introduce this, because obviously you can just use an exclamation mark when you're trying to not things. But um, it turns out that when you're using things in Lambda expressions, or um, particularly if you want to use method references, you can't use this syntax quite so easily. So let me show you an example. So here you might want to say, let's filter everything for um, where the the string is not empty, so like the string has some value, in Java 11, you can say uh, predicate.not string is empty. Let's static import this. Oops. And so if you kind of prefer the method reference way of doing stuff, then you might want to use the, the not uh, method there. So it's just a matter of style. It's a matter of preference, a matter of readability. So these little things are coming into the language as it, as it evolves. One of the things that I think is really interesting over the last few versions of Java, so I, I mentioned a little bit, where I can remember, I mentioned a little bit which version of Java these came into, but really, um, I, I think I sort of implied we shouldn't be using Java 9 and 10 because they were, 9 was replaced by 10, 10 was replaced by 11, 11 is the long-term support release, kind of, depending on who you get your, your JDK from. So really, now, if you're not using 8, you should be using 11 or 12, so I am talking about the version numbers like 9 and 10, but really I'm, I'm talking about like you will be using 11 or 12 and these features will be available in 11 and 12. So over the course of 9, 10 and 11, we've got a bunch more methods on optional. Um, since you all said you're using Java 8, are you using optional at all? A little, oh, quite a lot actually. Um, so I found optional really interesting in terms of a return type. So you could say, like, you found something or you didn't. That's kind of nice. I did try and abuse it terribly. So everywhere in my system that had a null, I would like go, oh, well, this can be optional. And then you end up in this hell of, like, is it null? Is it empty? And then you have to check the value of it everywhere. Um, that's not what optional is for. Um, so if you're using it uh, sort of generally in terms of returning an optional value, 
Obviously, a lot of the time, your code is just going to do a simple if present and then do something. Over the last few versions of, uh, of Java, there's been a bunch more methods to help us write that in a more functional style. Now, it might seem that those aren't really necessary. Maybe the, the if present was enough. Um, but let me show you some of them. Uh, do I have the right sorts of things? So obviously, you all know from Java 8, you know, if you do an is present and then a get, you should be doing um, an, oh, should we be doing that? Hmm, interesting. That's not what I wanted. Um, yes. Hmm. I really should have checked this. Is present of. OK. Um, so you, you shouldn't be using an is present and get. You should be doing um, uh, an is. You should be doing if present. Now, there are, like I say, there are a bunch more methods on optional now. So you can say an optional or else. And the or else will. Uh, where, which version did this come in? Because I can't remember where we were. Oh. Uh, completely lost my train of thought. The point is <laughs> that you can use IntelliJ to tell you what to do for all of these things. Um, there's, um, there's a bunch of different new uh, things, some of which I really like. So you can say uh, optional, what's this one? Optional.or. Um, and this will actually allow you to return another optional, not another value of optional. You can do uh, optional.stream, which allows you to, do, to use optional more effectively inside stream operations. Um, there's an else. Where's the else? Is this in here? Uh, with or else. Oh, yes. This is the one I wanted. So in Java 8, you can, you, if you're doing an is present, but you have an else, you can't use a functional style expression with that. You still have to do it inside an if statement, which is kind of like, well, that defeats the object of having optional. But if you're using a later version of Java, you can say you can provide two Lambda expressions, so if present or else. So that's quite a nice way of, um, of working with it. So it becomes, over the course of the last few releases, optional has become more and more functional. So if you're using if statements anywhere with optional, you shouldn't be. Um, there are lots more helper methods to help you with that, even like weird cases that probably the language designers thought, well, no one's ever going to want to do this with an optional. But when you're migrating an old code base to use optional, you find yourself in some gnarly code paths that you wouldn't have designed it that way if you'd had optional in the first place. Uh, so that's optional. And um, one of the things that came in Java 11 is a built-in HTTP client. Um, so some people are saying that they really like the fact that it's built in. It's not dependent on external libraries. Uh, it provides proper non-blocking reactive stream support, HTTP 1.1 and 2. So it's kind of there. It's part of the language, which makes life a lot easier if you're doing any sort of testing around um, HTTP. Um, Another feature which is useful, you're probably benefiting from it even if you don't realize you're benefiting from it, is um, multi-release jar files. What this means is that language, uh, library developers can create a single jar file which will use features from whichever version of Java you're running. So um, JUnit 5, for example, if you're running it on Java 11, it can use Java 11 features if they're available. Um, if you're running on Java 8, or pre-Java 9, it will not use any of the new features. Now, this is invisible to you. You don't have to select which version of JUnit you're running or which jar file you want to download. So the jar file just kind of magically supports individual versions of Java from 9, 10, 11, 12 forwards. So this is really useful. It helps that problem where you're like, well, I'm using Java 8, so I need to use this version of this library. Um, and, you know, we can't really talk about migrating off Java 8 without talking about, uh, about Jigsaw, because that was the big thing in Java 9, apparently. But uh, we're not supposed to call it Jigsaw. We're supposed to call it the Java module system, um, apparently. But it turns out that the Java module system, which was like this big feature that was super useful for the language developers, because it allows them to split up the, the JDK itself into modules and allows them to have separation of concerns and nice clean architecture. Uh, a lot of developers aren't necessarily looking at their, their monolith um, enterprise applications and going, I should make that modular, because they're like, wow, what a headache. Um, I already know it's not very well uh, separated. 
I'm not going to apply that. But um, for library developers, modularity is super useful because it allows them to encapsulate functionality um, so that users can't be reaching to the internals of a library and doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. Um, and some other people who are working on uh, bigger systems or creating new systems want to be able to use modularity like properly. So the modularity from Java 9 turns out to be quite useful. Um, what modularity is very useful for, as I sort of mentioned, is that it has modularized the JDK, it's modularized the Java language, which allows us to do some interesting things which we weren't able to do before. For example, JLink allows us to um, take our modular application and then package it up with just the bits of Java that we need. So we don't need a Java, we don't need a JRE, we don't need a big JDK. We can actually just create a deployable which has got the modules from Java that we need, which could potentially be a lot smaller than deploying the whole JDK into the cloud or wherever we're going to deploy our stuff to. Uh, let me give you a quick demo of this. I've actually got time left in this talk. This never happens. How exciting. Um, so um, here's my handy JLink uh, command line. I need to, I'm using Java 11. Uh, this is JLink. Um, I have to give it a module path, because if you know anything about um, the modularity changes in Java 9, there's now a module path, not a class path, if you're using modules. Um, so I'm putting in the modules from the JDK itself. I have a project which has like four modules. Um, so I'm putting in module three here and module four here. And then um, I use this magic incantation that I don't really understand because I can't remember what this project does. But basically, um, the three module is the one I really want. And then I'm going to output it to this um, three image thing. So what JLink is going to do is look at all those modules on the path and figure out what I really need for my application and bundle it all up into, um, into my three image. So I will do this. Let's see. OK, so it's done that. Let me quickly check the magic incantations that I need. So I'm going to go into three image. What have I got? So I've got a bin. Let's look in bin. Ooh. So this is where I've got uh, java.exe, java.w.exe, and the, the bin stuff I need to run Java. And uh, I can also do. I can actually use that, so I can use bin, Java, oh, not the DLL, uh, minus minus list modules. This shows me all the modules that I'm using in my application. So four and three are my modules from my application, and I'm only using java.base and java.logging from the JDK. I'm not using any more, any other parts of the JDK. So the JDK is like huge, it's got all sorts of stuff, um, and I'm only using those things. So it's only bundled those modules into my deployable. And so then let's have a look at that. Uh, where are we? If I do, is this gonna work? Uh, Let's have a look at the size of this. Oh, good, it's in bytes. Um, yeah, so it's like, what is that, 41 megabytes? I can't pass that. It's small. It's a small deployable. Uh, let's have a look here. I can do it here. I'll cheat because I'm a, I'm a visual person. I'm going to do it in Windows. Uh, properties. Yeah, so it's like, it's 39 meg. So I can deploy that to the cloud, I can deploy it to wherever I want to, and it's, it's tiny, it's not going to take up loads of space. Okay, so this is definitely a good thing. This is a, a major selling point, um, for, for not just for the new versions of Java, but also for modularity. This is kind of what modularity is for. All right, uh, what else have we got? And in Java 12, we got a preview of switch expressions. So one of the new things that has been coming in in recent versions of Java is the idea of preview features. So this allows us to actually kind of play with new features. It allows us to give feedback to the language developers um, without them kind of having to worry about setting um, a new syntax in stone. So preview features are available in the JDK. So for example, in Java 12, we have a preview of switch expressions. It's probably not a good idea to put switch expressions 
functions in your production code, because the chances are the syntax will change when it becomes non-preview. But it's there for us to play with, to give feedback, and to say how, you know, whether, whether it works, whether it gives us any value. So for example, switch expressions in particular, they've already decided there are some changes they want to make to it for, um, for Java 13. So it's, it's something that will be evolving over time, which wouldn't have been possible if we couldn't flag certain features as preview. Uh, let me show you switch expressions, because I think it's kind of cool. M well, mostly because like switch expressions, um, switch statements are ugly, right? <laughs> They're nasty. Like As soon as you see one, you think, I shouldn't be doing that. What, whatever it's doing, I should not be doing this. And so often, people think, well, this is probably a failure of polymorphism, and maybe there's a design pattern you should be using instead. And that's kind of true, but there are some cases where a switch is just the most um, effective thing to use. Like at the edges of our system, when we're taking input from customers, for example, or if we're taking values from a database, at some point, we're going to have to parse some of those values and turn it into something more object-oriented. But that often means we still need something like a switch statement. And switch statements are insanely ugly. It just looks like something from the 1980s. And we've got breaks, and we've got cases, and it's very easy to accidentally, so this case 80, in this case 80, 80, that's the same thing, but maybe you accidentally didn't do the right, maybe you didn't put a break in here, and then you can accidentally do, oh my goodness, it's just a nightmare. And then also, this type up here has to be a, a, a mutated value because you have to assign it up here, and then you have to well you have to create it up here and assign it inside here, and it's it's just it's just nasty, uh, it's just not good uh, modern Java. Uh, in Java 12, we can be using switch expressions, um, which is much more uh, well for start it's readable. We don't have um, we don't have any breaks. We don't have uh, we have nice little lambdas instead of semicolon instead of colons because like everyone likes arrows in their code these days, and we have obviously shrunk the code down to like a third of the size, and it's much easier to see. For example, that here we have multiple cases that go to one particular value. So from a readability point of view, this I think this is really nice, uh, and also you've got the switch thing here. So the whole point here is you you have this expression and the return is assigned to the type, so then this can be uh, final if you want it to be. OK? So switch expressions are definitely a good thing. It's still not something you should be littering in your code base. There are still design patterns for some things which are going to be a more effective way of making decisions. But where you had to use switch statements, switch expressions, I think, are going to be much prettier. But like I say, it's a preview feature. So if you start using it in production, be prepared for potentially the syntax and the keywords and stuff to change in the next version of Java. Um, if you are using it already and you do have some feedback, they are asking for feedback on the feature. So it's a good idea to sort of give them feedback on, oh, I don't really like the way this works, or I found a use case where it's kind of like a bit clunky. That's what they want to hear. So we've kind of come up to the modern world. Java 12 was released in March. So that's where we are at the moment. It's the most recent version of Java. 13 will be out in October. Um, so what's coming in the future? Given that we've got this like rapid release cadence, um, what have we got coming down in the future? Well, the good thing is that Mark Reinhold will be talking about this on this stage like in, in uh, 20 minutes. So, um, so you can kind of listen to a lot of the details. I think he'll be covering a lot of the details of this. But the whole point is that, um, as usual, Java is moving forward to be, be more readable, more productive, faster, more effective. And of course, mm, likely borrowing from other languages where perhaps readability is improved. So for exa example, one of the things that's interesting is data classes for Java. One of the things I like about Kotlin is the way their data classes work, because you don't have like you know 95 lines of getters, setters, two strings, equals, and hash code. So there's discussions going on, like how do we get data classes for Java? Um, Project uh, Amber, uh, well, I won't even try and go into these, because like Mark will go into them later. But there's lots and lots of things ongoing. So the whole point about the six monthly release cadence is to gradually drop more and more of these nice features in as and when they become ready, instead of like waiting three years and getting the here is everything, and none of it works. <laughs> I mean, it all works. It was very well tested, I'm sure. 
We all know what it's like to be a software developer. Right, so we love these, these language features. It's great. And a lot of these things, we're not talking about mind-blowing stuff from a, from a developer point of view. We're talking about nice methods on optional, which are kind of useful. And we're talking about collections, convenience methods, which are, again, useful, but nothing like mind-blowing. Um, and really, and the business does not care about any of these things. Like you can't go to the business and say, there's a new method on optional I really want to use. I think we should migrate to Java 12. They're just, they're not, they're not even going to laugh at you. <laughs> what the business and the users and ops and other people who are not developers care about are things like performance. So performance, generally speaking, every version of Java has been faster, generally speaking. Um, there are all sorts of optimizations and improvements that happen to the, to the JVM. There's, uh, there's always like runtimes, op different runtime optimizations. There's things like, well, I'll go into these in more detail. So for example, um, particularly recent versions of Java, let's say Java 11, if you're running Java 11 versus Java 8, you will see um, much better memory usage, generally speaking, in your application. Again, this is kind of interesting from a cloud point of view because often you are paying for things like memory. So this is a useful thing. Um, garbage collectors. I get a bit irritated with people who just assume that performance is always about garbage collection, but um, the garbage collection can obviously impact your application performance quite heavily. Um, and in Java, by the time we get to Java 11, um, we have a bunch of, diff of changes to garbage collectors. For example, G1 is the default GC, and we have parallel full GC for G1, um, and we've got two new experimental garbage collectors in Java 11. Note the word experimental. <laughs> so it's worth trying them out, seeing if they work for you. Um, or, you know, not. And Java 12, uh, we have another experimental garbage collector, even more updates to G1 and more improvements to ZGC. So um, a lot of changes in garbage collection since Java 8. And these could potentially give a lot of improvements for your particular application. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to just use a new J JDK, not do any tuning or anything, and just have it perform better? I mean, that would be a massive win for the business. Of course, provided your application still works on Java 12, which I'm sure it does. Um, so obviously, related to this, better performance, better use of memory, um, smaller deployables from things like jailing and stuff like that, we are talking about potentially it is going to cost less money, potentially, to, uh, to run a newer version of Java. But it's not just about money in terms of uh, deployment and, and like a measurable monthly cost. There's also another cost in terms of, of us, the developers. If you continue to use older versions of Java and don't move with the time, the ability to retain and attract new developers is going to diminish over time. Um, as you who was working on Java 6 over there, whoever you are, as well as full well you know. <laughs> so um, there is another cost to uh, recruitment and retention here, which is a, an interesting thing. But again, that's just us developers going, we'd like to play with new technologies. There's a cost if you don't move to the new version, because I will leave. The other um, benefit, I think, is that I think we should be looking at catching the six-month release train before it gets away from us. Now, at the moment, we can be talking about um, migrating from Java 8, which is a long-term support release, to Java 11. It's like, I think it's like four years worth of like um, stuff that went into. So we've got Java 8, Java 11. I mean, there's a good chunk of new functionality and changes, plus um, the big changes that went in Java 9. So it's potentially um, a big upgrade. But imagine if you decide to wait until Java 17 comes out. Uh, that's, that's not an upgrade that's ever going to happen. So you really want to get on this now. And what I think would be a good idea um, so I used to work with Dave Farley, and he always used to say this. He'd say, if it hurts, do it more frequently and bring the pain forward. And that doesn't seem to make any sense, because you're like, if it hurts, do it more often? I mean, no, thank you. <laughs> yes, hit me on the head more often. I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. But it is, it's about the exponential pain. As you know from continuous delivery, if you release every three months, every six months, every year, that release is just insanely painful. But if you release every day, it's just a small, tiny pinch. And it's the same with um, doing the upgrades to Java. We really want to get on that now, take that hit, that first hit, and then perhaps be thinking about using those six monthly releases to at least test in continuous integration. We don't have to use them in production, but we can be getting on the six monthly release cadence and staying up to date so we have small incremental changes to test instead of having to do this massive migration to maybe Java 17 in three years' time. 
So I did mention the word pain. <laughs> that doesn't sound very nice. So what sort of pain am I talking about? There's a lot of fear around Java 9 and modularity. So a lot of people were saying that Java 9 broke everything. There was a lot of pain for people like library developers. There was a lot of pain for people like um, IDE vendors, because we relied on a lot of the internals of the JDK. Um, generally, um, I've migrated a few open source projects from pre-Java 8 to Java 11 and found they kind of just worked. Um, which was kind of surprising, um, because a lot, of the a lot of the problems introduced by modularity, a lot of the problems introduced around getting rid of like tools.jar and rt.jar are all taken care with by your tools, languages, fr frameworks, libraries. So generally, our applications probably didn't break that badly. Um, and part of the modularity was encapsulating internal APIs. So if we were using something which is an internal API, um, that internal API, which we shouldn't have been using, by the way, that internal API is no longer accessible. So that's where we could start seeing some pain if we were doing stuff that we shouldn't have been doing. Um, similarly, Java 11, later versions of Java are now taking deprecation much more seriously. So if it said it was deprecated, it is probably going away. Um, so Java 11 removed Java EE and Corba. It deleted methods. Um, so there have been changes. And again, this is why we want to do this upgrade now, not like in some future version when even more deprecated stuff has just gone away. Uh, so oh, we've got five minutes left. Oh, that went fast. Um, Tips for migration. I'm going to do some quick tips for migration. I did write an article about this on InfoQ. There's a link to it at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. So um, if you want more detailed tips, feel free to read that um, article, because then I don't have to talk about it here. Uh, firstly, run, it, run your application on an updated JDK. Don't recompile it. Don't make any changes. Don't do it. Just run it on an updated JDK. It, it might just work. I have seen this work. And that's the whole point about the backwards compatibility of Java, is you should be able to run your application on an updated version of Java without changes, in theory. Um, address compiler warnings. So before you've even migrated to a newer version of Java, while you're on 8 or an earlier version, if you have compiler warnings, um, do fix those warnings. They are there for a reason. So if you have warnings saying things like underscore as a variable name is going away in Java 9, then you should get rid of your variable name um, of an underscore. If you've got deprecation warnings, you should be addressing those. Update your dependencies. You should be doing this anyway for security reasons, right? You shouldn't be dependent on old dependencies because there can be um, security problems with old JAR files, for example. Um, but you will probably need to update your dependencies to the most recent things. Um, you will probably have to add new dependencies. So Java 11 removed the Java EE stuff, some Java EE stuff from the JDK. And most of us who aren't using Java EE were like, well, big deal. But we were all using Jaxby and didn't know it. So we probably need to add an external dependency on Jaxby, things like JavaFX, which is no longer part of the JDK. Um, these things, we just have to add new dependencies for some of these things. It's fairly straightforward, um, but it's, it needs to be done. One of the things you will need to do is you will need to update your build tool. Um, Maven and Gradle do work with Java 12, um, but it needs to be, I think it's, uh, oh, I can't remember the exact versions, but um, the old versions of Maven and Gradle will not work with new versions of Java. So you do need to up update your build tool. Then, when you've done all of that, then you can think about compiling against the updated JDK. And then, if it compiles, if your tests run in, in production, then you can think about start using the shiny new features. Now, I know what we want to do is compile against Java 12 and start using Java 12 features straight away. Uh, that is the last thing we should be doing. We should be doing this gradual migration. And we can be doing these steps while we're using um, Java 8. We don't need to use a, no a new version of Java straight away. Uh, three minutes left. No time for questions. Oh, that's a shame. Um, <laughs> in summary, <laughs> Uh, Java is changing, and it is changing fast. It is evolving every six months. And we are getting new features every six months. Not necessarily huge amounts of new features, because we're only getting them every six months. But it is evolving very quickly. Um, modern Java can help you and your application in terms of performance, cost, maintenance. When I say maintenance, I sort of think a lot of these readability features as being helpful for code maintenance. Because if your code is more readable, it's more maintainable, it's lower cost to maintain, it's all good. Um, I've kind of alluded to this, um, but I haven't got into it in detail. There are basically two upgrade options. Um, you can kind of, you could upgrade to Java 11 and be on your long-term support release. 
obviously, again, you have to look at which vendor you want to get your JDK from. Do you want to pay for support? Um, you could be upgrading every three years to the long-term support release, which means you should be looking at moving to Java 11, or upgrade straight to 12, and then think about upgrading every six months. And I kind of think that perhaps uh, we should be looking at perhaps upgrading to um, 11 now, and then maybe updating um, our continuous continuous integration environment with uh, the six monthly releases, but not necessarily using them in production, because then we're ready to migrate um, as soon as we are uh, ready, basically. Uh, so all of the um, references for this talk are here. I've got a link to a bunch of different articles, including the article about migrating to um, Java 11 or 12, and um, loads of stuff about the specific features that, um, that we have covered in all of these things, um, slides, videos, etc., all at this link. Uh, so please go here for more information. Thank you very much. I've got like 30 seconds for questions, right? Is that true? Yeah. Any questions? Um, come, I'm at the JetBrains booth all day today, so come to the JetBrains booth if you want to grab me. Um, also, come to my talk at 4 o'clock if you want to as well. All right, thanks.